This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 248, recorded on August 30th, 2013. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello and you are listening to TWIV the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today right here in the TWIV studio, Dixon Despommier. Hello, Vincent. How have you been, Dixon? Been well, and I've also been good. <laughs> I've you, been both of those things. And you've been away, right? I have, I have, I have, yes, I have. You've been in Down Under. Yeah. Was it good? Yes, it was very good. The last time I was there was in 1986. Things have changed a bit since I was there last. Yes, change is the way things go. Right? Oh, you know, I when I was there last, I was on sabbatical in the uh, at the Walter and Eliza Hall in uh, Melbourne, and uh, I had the privilege of visiting Alice Springs that year, and it was a dusty little truck stop on the way from uh, Adelaide all the way up to Darwin. There's a road that goes right up through the middle of Australia, and that's where they stop for gas and overnighting and that sort of thing. And it had one tourist shop where you could buy artifacts from uh, the indigenous people that uh, painted their walkabouts. So we went back, of course, in mm. 2013, and it's now a town of 25,000 people. It's all been yuppified. There's a Doubletree Hotel there. There's a whole bunch of... <laughs> it looked like uh, some developer just came through and did, redid the whole place. Nothing's immune, Dixon. Nothing. It was disappointing. It, it lost all of its charm in that time well, the anyway. Australians who listen might not agree with <laughs> no, that. No, I think they would, actually. They were a little bit dismayed over the whole thing, actually. Also joining us today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi, fellas. How, How you doing? doing? How are you, Rich? I'm good. Good weather down there? Uh, yeah, we have here. Uh, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> uh, 91 degrees Fahrenheit, so wow. it's a hottish day. That's 32.8 Celsius, yep. uh, you know, sort of half cloudy. Humidity is 46%, 2.68 degrees, so it's not too humid, <laughs> but it would kill most normal individuals. I think we're uh, working up to some thunderstorms this afternoon. It'll cool things off a bit. It's Florida is what it is. It is. <laughs> That's right. Here it's 27C. It's, hmm. uh, yeah, it's partly cloudy, but the sky is blue. He has 60% humidity. It's pretty high today. Yeah. He's been in the 20s, 30s all week. Winds out of the west at 14 kilometers an hour. So, Dixon, 14 kilometers, is that a wind you can feel? It is. I didn't feel any wind this morning. Did you? <laughs> well, did you stick your hand out the window? <laughs> I walked here from the garage. Oh, that's There different. was no wind. No, well, the wind isn't measured at places like this. I think they do that at airports and stuff like that. Oh, I see. So it's irrelevant. I shouldn't say what the wind is. Though. No, no, no. It's, you know, people are curious. Well, that's, it's data. It's you know? data. Exactly right. It is data. It helps define us. Uh, <laughs> you know, we uh, have some follow-up from me here before we start. Let me look here to see if there's any other follow-up. Last week was 247. So let's see if someone had a follow-up from 247. Oh, here's one from Steve. Steve, which we talked about. So I will paste that into the show notes so that um, Rich can see it. There it is. Oh, I screwed it up, huh? I, Close I paste, enough. I pasted it into the wrong place. Let me, let me paste it down here. Here we go. All right, Steve, uh, who wrote last time about... He's going to start listening to all the podcasts ah, starting yes. with episode one and he wants to know if right. we, we want him to look for anything. <laughs> so he responds, as Kathy suggested, moving forward, I will listen for and compile a list of we what we should do in a podcast uh, and we what person we should have on Twitter. I'll send that list for every 50 or so episodes reviewed. I'll include episode, time code, speaker, and phrase. Let me know if you'd like different information. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Two, the kind of statements I collect are just general statements that interest me and could be generally applied. Below is a short list of a few pulled so far. Successful systems attract parasites. Do not over-rely on rationalization. Work from the data and observations. 
this shows you you have to work on weird stuff. <laughs> <laughs> the assumption we are all working on is what is that what you find in simple organisms is true for the most complicated. And it makes science go better when you collaborate. It makes it go a lot faster and a lot smoother. I like that. Here, here. That's really good. It makes it sound like we know something <laughs> or, or we're wise or something. That's right. He hasn't gotten to the part That's where, really good. where I said trust science, don't trust scientists yet, but he will. <laughs> Get to it. And then number three, perhaps a good way to do a general TWIV and episode-specific index, which is something we talked about last time, oh, wow. would be to transcribe and time code the episodes and then index the transcripts. You could crowdsource the transcription to the TWIV listener base via a wiki so that many could contribute. With such a wiki in place, I would guess, purely a guess, it may be rather easy to have transcription complete within a week of podcast release. Going backward in the catalog may be another issue, yeah. But going forward, it might work. Well, we could try that. Maybe you'd like yeah. to set up a wiki for us, Steve. I mean, I've tried it before, and I didn't do very well, so. Yes, yes, Rich. The, uh... The phrase, the the phrase I like that I learned on Twiv early on that I use all the time is the mice lie and monkeys exaggerate. Yeah, that's a good one. I like that's that one. That's a good one. All right, I have a follow up of my own. To the last episode, we talked about the MERS coronavirus. We had Ian Lipkin on talking about his efforts to try and find the source of the virus. He's looking in bats, which is a reasonable place to look. And last time we mentioned that uh, a Times article had appeared uh, summarizing the Lipkin paper, which was published in Emerging Infectious Diseases. That was published in the paper on August 21st. It's an article by Don McNeil. It's entitled, Mystery Virus That's Killed 47 is Tied to Bats in Saudi Arabia. And the first um, sentence of that article, health officials confirmed Wednesday that bats in Saudi Arabia were the source of the mysterious virus that has sickened 96 people in the Middle East. That's what really bothered me, that statement, because I don't think finding 190 nucleotides in a bat confirms that that is the source of the infection. So I wrote to McNeil, we went back and forth a bit, and he eventually fa wrote a follow-up article, which was published... Uh, just this week, it was published on August 27th, and uh, the, head, the title of the article is Some Scientists Cast Doubt on Finding of Origins of a Virus, and he basically uh, said you know, all the caveats that we talked about, the fragment was found only in one bat, it was a tiny sample, some scientists who publicly or privately aired their concerns about the strength of the finding nonetheless agreed that the virus probably was in the bat and would be found in others when more can be sampled. And they talk about the pressures to publish and so forth. Um, so basically, I, I think it's good that he published this article saying that um, so a lot of scientists don't agree with the conclusion. But one thing I do object to is... Um, his statement that some professional jealousies may be fueling the controversy. <laughs> I just don't understand where that comes from at all. Yeah, I didn't sense that. But, you know. But that's I didn't say. I'm not yeah, jealous, right. by the way. Just for the record, I am not jealous of anyone, in fact. Not even you, Dixon. Oh, thank you. All right. <laughs> I'll take that as a high compliment. <laughs> One of the, so the whole point of my objection is that we don't have the evidence that proves that the reservoir is in bats yet. And I gave a couple of examples of alternate explanations that would be consistent with finding this in a bat. And I shouldn't have done that because that that sets you up for people <laughs> to shoot them down. So one idea I had was maybe this bat ate something that had the virus in it. And that's why they found it in the feces. And in this article, Lipkin says, that can't be because these bats only eat insects. Mm. You know, so it could be if the insect had fed on an animal that was infected with the virus, right? But here, here. that's not the point of this. The point of this is how, actually, and this brings up a good discussion, how do you prove that a animal is a reservoir for a virus? Right. What kind of evidence do you need? And right. so I went back and I looked at the SARS literature because for SARS, it's been very well established that uh, bats were the origin of the SARS coronavirus, 
And this is a very interesting story. There's a great review article which was published in 2007. It's called A Review of Studies on Animal Reservoirs of the SARS Coronavirus. And a ton of work was done. I mean, initially, the virus was found in palm civets. Right. But the genetic diversity of the isolates, they were clearly SARS-like, was so limited that it seemed like that wasn't really a reservoir where the virus was diversifying and multiplying. So they kept looking. They went to bats, and they found the virus in bats which, with greater genetic diversity and much less identity, but clearly the SARS-like virus. So they is- multiple <coughs> labs isolated it from bats in different parts of China, multiple isolates. They got full genome sequences, and they also found antibodies mm-hmm. to the viruses in the bats. Full genome sequences and antibodies. They couldn't isolate the virus. It doesn't grow very well in, in uh, cell culture at all. So I think that's a hard bar to set. But I think if you had multiple full genomes and antibodies in, in bats, different bats from different investigators, I think that would be the sure. what you need. That's right. right. Did Ian Lipkin, in his discussion, raise those points? Yeah, we talked about those. No, I mean in the paper. No. no the paper was quite short and just reported the findings, actually. Right. Right. So it was in the journal. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, there uh, it was in uh, uh, emerging infectious diseases. As a matter of fact, in the article, they're pretty circumspect about you know uh, it being the ultimate source and that kind of stuff. They, they you know, they don't they don't say this is it in the paper. Um, but you know, you know, I think it's highly likely that a bat is the source. But huh. that's not. I mean, proof. if you want to identify it so that you can prevent further introductions. You have to really be sure it's there. That's true. And we're not. And it's not likely that it went from bats to people, right? So maybe there's an intermediate animal. you got to identify that, too. So the palm civet was the intermediate between bats and people in the SARS crossover. So they have to find that animal, too, in this case. So there's a lot more to do. So to say that we've identified the source was just, I think, scientifically inappropriate. And I just don't want the big readership of the Times to think that the story is sorted out. That's all. Well, I'm glad he published his follow-up. That's good. Yeah, that's good. And camels have antibodies against this too, right? But they have no viral sequences. So uh, a paper, appara- yeah, go ahead, Rich. Apparently, apparently uh, yeah, I don't, Vincent, maybe you know the details of that. The, uh, apparently, we're going to learn a lot more about this in the future. Yeah, a paper was published um, not too long ago saying camels have antibodies that react with the virus. But, of course, that can be misleading because... It could be cross-reactive, right? Of course. So you need to follow that up. and. Yep. As happened during the recent, not so recent, in 1999, the outbreak of West Nile in, New, in New, the New World, uh, they thought it was St. Louis and Cephalitis virus because of yeah, this cross-reactivity. Yeah. All right. Now, we have a cool paper to discuss today, which was published uh, just this week in PLOS Biology. And the um, the title of the paper reminds me of um, the splicing paper. Right. Remember that, Rich? The yeah. amazing sequence at the five prime right. end of adenovirus mRNAs. This paper is called The Extraordinary Evolutionary History of the Reticuloendotheliosis Viruses. And uh, the authors are Anna Maria Nui, Nui Adamska and Robert Gifford from the Aaron Diamond AIDS Research Institute here in New York City. And I was sent this under embargo by a journalist for for commentary, and this has been picked up all over the place because it's such a cool story. Yeah. So reticuloendotheliosis viruses are uh, viruses that infect birds. They're retroviruses. They cause a rather rare disease of both game birds and waterfowl. And the disease includes anemia, immunosuppression, cancers, runting, and feathers, problems with the feathers. It was first isolated from a turkey in 1957. It's always been thought that these were a, a, a strictly avian viruses. And so basically, these guys have stumbled onto the finding that this virus originated. From, or it was a crossover of a mammalian virus uh, into birds. And the story starts with them. They were actually looking into retroviruses in Malagasy mammals. You know what a Malagasy mammal is, Dixon? 
Malagasy. How do I pronounce it? Well, it's from Madagascar. Yeah, Ma- very good. I had to look that up. Madagascar, very good. That's a very interesting island, actually. And lots um, of endemic species. <laughs> <laughs> That's where lemurs come from. Is That's that exactly right? Exactly right. And it's got a huge uh, diversity of uh, chameleons. As and well. lemurs are cool because are they cool. are the only animal endogenized with lenti. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, wow. And they have unusual trees there, too. They have these big bottle trees. Anyway, they they were looking into the endogenous retroviruses in these mammals, and they identified in a ring-tailed mongoose and also a narrow-striped mongoose, (laughs) striped, (laughs) a endogenous retroviruses in the genome of the animal. It's an endogenous retrovirus. That's by definition a virus clearly highly related to these REVs, these reticuloendotheliosis viruses of birds. By the way, just as an aside, yeah. I know we've had a previous conversation about this today. For those listeners that are younger than me... Uh, 99%. They, <laughs> probably right. I grew up knowing what the reticuloendothelial system was, but a lot of people don't use that term anymore because it's an outdated paradigm, as they would say. So what, what is the reticuloendothelial system, Vince? Why are you asking me? <laughs> because you didn't know either. <laughs> I don't know either. You tell me. <laughs> oh, stop. You guys are killing me. <laughs> I'm younger than you, Dixon. <laughs> yes, I know that. <laughs> okay, the reticuloendothelial system, as I learned it as a uh, an undergraduate and then as a graduate student here at Columbia, is the system uh, that combines together the phagocytic capacity of the host. So macrophages, histiocytes, which now have been replaced with dendritic cells and and the Kupfer cells in the liver, for instance, those are all, and right. spleen, they, those are all those cells together constitute the reticuloendothelial system. That's That was the term that they applied to it. So reticuloendotheliosis is hyperplasia of reticuloendothelial tissue. Right. Which means multiplication of the cells, right. right? So how do you get an anemia out of that? Because in the bone marrow, you displace uh, the, all of the, the red cells. Do the yeah. macrophages gobble up the red cells or something? Or they displace, or displace the bone them? marrow. They displace the bone marrow. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's right. So Likewise, immunosuppression. Here, here. That's right. So this is a virus that does that. Okay. And that's a, it has to be a retrovirus, right? It is. It is a retrovirus. This REV is, is certainly a retrovirus. Because, yeah. because the big retrovirus, HIV, infects a, uh, an immunocompetent cell as well. Right. I'm sorry, say that again? HIV, HIV infects, infects T cells. cells as well. Yeah, it infects T cells, right. Right. So do, wait, that raises another question then. Do all retroviruses infect um, reticuloendothelial-derived cell types? No. They don't. So which one? Well, saying all in a question is always a... <laughs> well, do you know an exception to that? Let's put it this way. Do you know a retrovirus that does not infect uh, an immunocompetent cell? I could look one up. I don't know one offhand. Right. Um, an immune cell. Yeah. That's their target. I'm sure there are. We'll, we'll uh, let our listeners go after it. All right. That's, that's All right. as a non-virologist asking that question, by the way. Yeah. I, I, um, so you would like to know if there is a retrovirus that infects skin muscle cells, cells or, or muscle cells? Yeah, 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 yeah. Rhabdomyosarcoma virus? Is that a retro? <laughs> Is it? <laughs> yeah, I believe it is. <laughs> so I think there are. Okay. But we could confirm it. I don't want to Google it right now. All right. I'll lose track of my thought. Okay. So they found this <clears throat> REV in a mongoose. Um, two, two mongooses. Two, mong- two mongooses, two mongoose? I guess. Uh, 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 mongooses. I mongooses. That's up. right. That's right. It's not a gaggle of, a gaggle of mongoose. <laughs> oh, God. It's rare, rarely mongoose. Usually mongooses. Mongooses? Okay. Yep. And it's not a baby mongo- mon- mongozzling? <laughs> no. So basically they could then take all the known sequences of REVs and these two known ones and do a phylogenetic analysis, and it became clear that these old uh, REVs in the mongoose, they're quite old. They're like 8 million years old. That's old. And uh, Contemporary REVs are all derived from a common precursor, which circulated about 23 to 25 million years ago. Wow. Uh, and importantly, or at least interestingly, mm-hmm. they also found it in an echidna, 
uh, which is a spiny right. anteater that hangs out in Australia. It's a monotreme. So this is not a geographically uh, isolated event. Yeah. Right? And I think that what's really, maybe you're getting here, Vincent, yeah, but what's right. really cool about dating this thing is that they figured out what the integration site was in the two mongooses. That's incredible. Uh, and, and it was the same integration site, which implies oh, wow. a common ancestor. So it says that it had to have integrated before those two mongooses speciated from each other. Right. And wow. yet the closest available ancestor to those mongooses that they could look at did not have the integration. So that puts a window wow. on the date for this endogenization of this virus. Right. Ooh. Very cool. So you have a virus in mammals right. and then later in birds. So again, these REVs are thought to be bird viruses, right? right. Even though we only isolated them in the 1950s. That we, yeah. People think, yeah, these are bird viruses, but clearly they originated in mammals. So they said, let's figure out, let's see if we can figure out how these viruses made the jump from mammals to birds. So it turns out that two of the known REVs, uh, they're called duck infectious anemia virus and spleen necrosis virus, okay? And they sequenced the duck infectious anemia virus uh, genome, and they put it into this phylogeny. They're very closely related to, the, to these mammalian uh, REVs. Mm. And it turns out that duck infectious anemia virus and spleen necrosis virus were both isolated from ducks that were infected with Plasmodium lofurae mm -hmm. in 1959. Mm -hmm. All right. And so this brings them to the story of Plasmodium lofurae, which is uh, in TWIP realm, Dixon. Yes, it is. Right? Yes, it is. So they tell this nice story in the paper. Uh, basically, in the, you know, in the 30s, and people wanted to have animal models for malaria. And as you have said on TWIP, Dixon, there were malarial species that could infect birds. Sure. But we didn't have any of them here in the U.S., apparently. Mm. And they make a point in the paper saying that Plasmodium gallinaceum is that, yes. uh, was used in the U.K. and in Europe, but we didn't have it here. So investigators at the Rockefeller wanted to find their own model, so they went to... Not, not only did we not have it here, but they wouldn't let us import that, okay, because right. they For were afraid reasons. of what it would do to the poultry. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Absolutely. Right. So they went hunting, and they ended up looking in the Bronx Zoo, right? and they isolated P. lofurae from a fire-backed Borneo pheasant. Is that it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, which is one of the birds that was up there in the zoo. And they took the P. lofurae. They called it lofurae after that pheasant. They brought it into the lab, and they found that it infected, you know, chicks and ducks and turkeys. Yep. So they hey, we have a model. They started right. studying, and they made stocks of this P. lofurae in these right. and, and young animals of, of each of these bird species. And they studied it, and they gave it to investigators all over the country, basically, right? They um, did. And Bill Traeger in 1959, um, by that point he had recognized that these P. lofurae stocks were – not only causing malaria, but they were inducing an anemia that seemed to be dissociated from the uh, parasite. Right. And he showed in a paper that it was a filtrable agent. It was a virus. He called it spleen necrosis virus way back in 1959. I just found the paper, actually, where he describes that. Nice. So the He was idea, indeed a man for all seasons, by the way. Yeah, so you knew Bill Traeger, right? Knew you very well. Didn't you work for him? Yeah, not you, for him. No one worked for Bill Traeger. <laughs> They worked with him. It was he was such a, a wonderful man. He was the world's best listener. That's what he was. You were his postdoc, right? Well, I went into his laboratory, but I was working with someone else who was also in his laboratory, uh, George Jackson. Okay. But uh, Bill Traeger used to have a a, 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 a a daily lunch where everybody gathered around with their brown bags of whatever they had for lunch, and each one would tell whatever they discovered yesterday or the day before that in the lab. And he, that's where I learned a, a tremendous amount about Prolasmodium lofuri. Yes, this is great. Yeah. So while you were there, they were working on P. lofuri. Among other things. They were trying to culture malaria. That was their big uh, push. Yeah. Bill Traeger spent most of his adult right. life trying to culture malaria. That was his big thing. He did, right? He did, but it was a partial culture, okay? For lofuri, yeah. he could get it to go through several generations before the culture burned out, basically. 
he can get a, a, a cell type, which was the red cell of the duck, which, by the way, have nuclei in them, mm -hmm. as opposed to mammalians. Um, and they, they would last for 16 days in culture, and then they would just fall apart. Right. That now was... The, uh, so my wife, actually, while I was looking for <laughs> P. Fury and Traeger, I found a paper uh, that my wife published with Bill Traeger. Nice. He was a postdoc with George Cross. Oh, yeah. And it's a paper uh, published in 1984. Right. Where they looked at both falciparum and lofuri. Right. Histidine rich protein genes in their transcripts sure. of P. falciparum and P. lofuri. Bingo. So this is incredible. Now, the, the interesting thing here, or one of the interesting things, is that <laughs> there's no more P. lofuri anywhere. All the stocks are gone, according to this paper. Well, there's a good reason for that, too. And no one has ever isolated it from another animal in the wild since 1930, <laughs> whatever, in the Bronx Zoo. So right. it's gone. So, and why is that, Dixon? Well, the history of it is that um, P. lofuri did become the animal model for a certain type of malaria. They had a, a mouse malaria already, Plasmodium burgii. Right. And uh, they had another um, version of that, which they have ended up calling Plasmodium uelii. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Ueli was a physician and a researcher at NYU, and I, I knew him as well back in the 60s and 70s. But, but the Tullifers, working at the University of Chicago, uh, were the first ones to actually apply P. lofuri to uh, a rigorous scientific examination of the parasit parasitism that it caused in birds. Mm. And uh, ironically, one of their graduate students ended up in uh, Bill Traeger's laboratory, Dr. Philip D'Alessandro, who you know Yeah, from. I knew Phil. <laughs> yeah, he was my <laughs> former chairman, as a yeah. matter of fact. So, so there's all these interconnections. I think the fields of virology have similar patterns of connections from laboratory to laboratory. So, hmm. so the point is that uh, the cultures burned out at the end of 16 days. I mean, if you infected uh. ducks... All of the ducks became infected, first right. of all. They were all highly susceptible. Number two, at, if you infected the ducks within an hour of one another, all of the parasites in all of the ducks were at exactly the same stage of development mm. throughout the life cycle. So you could get synchronized infections, and you could get lots of material. And that was the advantage of infecting 10 ducks at a time. So Bill Trigger had lots of ducks, and uh, of course they all died at the end of the experiment. But And he collected blood at various times, and then tried to get those stages to grow in vitro. And he was using all kinds of... Um, Technologies, chemostats, uh, shake them, don't shake them, add oxygen, increase the CO2. I mean, it's a multiple variables system that is very difficult to, to try to control for because it's parasites living inside of a red cell, living inside your bloodstream. That's the problem that they faced. The whole thing was cracked wide open by a very innocent experiment done by a postdoc by the name of James Jensen, because at the same time he was working with Plasmodium lofuri, he was also working with Plasmodium falciparum, the human malaria. Now, the, the human malaria, which is the disease causer that everybody wants to immunize against or make a drug that eliminates the whole thing, <coughs> this parasite lives in a reduced oxygen tension environment. And it lives in a stasis environment because the capillary becomes blocked. When that happens, the oxygen tension drops and the parasite begins to replicate. It doesn't happen before that. So although Dr. Traeger was, and that's how we referred to him, no one ever referred to him as Bill or Traeger. They used Dr. Traeger because he was such a, uh, an icon and such a, a gentleman and a scholar, widely read, highly tolerant, of all opinions, because <laughs> he, he had a wide variety of people working in his laboratory. He was a wonderful example of the best person to work for. All right? So as Jim Jensen walks into the laboratory, <coughs> he sees what Dr. Traeger is doing and wonders whether or not they would grow better under reduced oxygen conditions than he could replicate with his chemostat that he was working on. And... Um, Dr. Traeger turned to Jim and said, uh, well, what did you have in mind? He said, well, you know those, uh, the bell jars that they use to grow uh, anaerobes in? So, oh, gee, I've never thought of that. <laughs> so, brand new idea, old concept, put the bell jar there, they uh, put the petri dishes filled with red cells and infected red cells from pre falciparum inside the bell jar, lit the candle, put the top on, turned 
the top of the uh, bell jar uh, the valve to shut off the outside source of oxygen. And as soon as the candle went out, it meant that the oxygen tension had been reduced sure. greatly. Yeah. And as the result of that, <laughs> that's how they learned to culture Plasmodium falciparum. And at that moment, P. La Fury became totally extraneous. They didn't want to work on it anymore. It was a mess to begin with. And everything else centered now on this new technology uh -huh. for raising Plasmodium falciparum. Yeah. And nobody's ever isolated uh, Lo Fury again, right? right. Well, they didn't have to because this thing took off. And, you know, they, just, they say in the paper that the research on P. Lo Fury ceased in the 80s when stocks could no longer be replenished. But that's because they didn't want to. Right, right. Exactly right. In the 80s, that's when they learned how to culture Plasmodium uh, falciparum. <laughs> interesting. They said they've, they've had expeditions to Borneo to try and get it, but they didn't find it. And you couldn't freeze it and preserve it, so that's the reason why you don't have any left. I guess this pheasant in the zoo had come directly from Borneo, so they figured... They went back there. So basically, the phylogeny together with this history indicates that these stocks of P. Lofure introduced REVs into birds. Exactly. From and one, and, of, one, of, one of the really cool parts about this paper that I like is that a significant <laughs> part of the methods and the content of the paper is a literature review. Yes. That, <laughs> yes. that, that traces the whole history exactly. of Lofure and How the association that? with this virus. Okay, oh, very cool. About that. Yeah. Um, so the, this is a single introduction of REV right. into birds, and somehow it has spread globally since then. Now, these stocks of P. Lofuri were sent all over the place, sure so that were. might be part of it. That's true. But there's another part of this story uh, that I'm going to turn over to Rich because it involves big DNA viruses. Oh. Right. So it turns out that... Uh, uh, possibly one of the vectors that helped spread this REV into the wild uh, was foul pox. Oh. Now, it's been known for some time that uh, some wild strains of foul pox, uh, can, and this has always been a, a, a really inter fascinating mystery, some uh, strains of foul pox in the wild contained uh, a full-length integrated copy of this retrovirus. <laughs> that's sitting there between a couple of genes. And that's, you know, actually, that, it, for, for people like me, that's always been a terrific paradigm for how something like a pox virus could pick up a cellular gene, okay? Because it could be reverse transcribed and integrated into the genome. But in this case, it's a whole retrovirus. Uh, now, it turns out as... Uh, it's, it's, it's sort of sketchy here, and I don't think it would be easy to put the whole thing together. But people were culturing Lofure at the same time as they were trying to make attenuated foul pox, because foul pox <laughs> is a disease of yeah, birds. Sure, sure. Okay? Sure. Um, and as a matter of fact, people were working on Merrick's disease as well, which is a, a herpes virus, mm. uh, an avian herpes virus that mm. causes a, a really uh, a disease of very high significance uh, in, in agriculture and in, in, in poultry. And at the same time as people were uh, studying, <laughs> labs were, uh, you know, working on avian uh, uh, diseases of one sort or another and trying to figure out uh, uh, malaria, this is during World War II and et cetera, right. and trying to make uh, vaccines against uh, foul pox and Merrick's disease, mm -hmm. the Suspicion is that somewhere along the line, perhaps in a laboratory, some REV from uh, this Lafore uh, stock that may have contaminated some avian cells in the lab wound up uh, essentially endogenizing or jumping into. It's not endogenizing. Well, I guess it's because it's still active. Uh, jumping into a phallopox genome. And then perhaps uh, through uh, a vaccine was introduced into the wild. And yeah. now you – because you can infect animals wow. with this foul pox virus with the REV and launch the REV infection right. off of the foul pox <laughs> and the birds will get sick. And now you've got REV that can, uh, that can transmit on its own. What are we doing? Uh, and it, it's also – although uh, there are strains of um, – the uh, Merrick's disease virus uh, out there 
that they don't contain full length REV, but they contain uh, an LTR, a piece of it. Okay, so it's a, it's uh, it's apparent that uh, Merrick's disease virus at some point or another uh, experienced a hit and run by REV as well. <laughs> and in China, REV alone is spreading through birds. Mm-hmm. So without the pox virus wow. or herpes virus vectors. What's the mortality rate from that? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. It's yeah. pretty rare disease, but uh, apparently this virus is... A lot of chickens are seropositive because of the pox or the herpes virus that's mm-hmm. passing through them. So a lot yeah. of them don't get sick, but they end up having antibodies to the, to the virus. So again... This is all traced to a single introduction yeah, of yeah. REV into birds. So one of the interesting questions I have is, when was this pheasant, when did the pheasant acquire yeah, that's, yeah. REV? Sure. So but, they got a little fury from the pheasant, and presumably their virus was already in there, right? Well, I don't know. I don't think you necessarily know well, that. Hang on. I mean, it could be. Uh, I, I think that's the, that's the easiest because it was a zoo, right? Yeah. I, yes. I think so, because mm. P. Lofuri won't last forever in a pheasant any more than it will in a duck. And if the pheasant is a natural host and therefore um, resistant mm-hmm. to the lethality of, of malaria, uh, and they control it and wipe it out, uh, it wouldn't have been there when they looked for it very long. So that must have been a recent capture, move to New York City, take the blood as soon as they get there, and bingo, you've got two things at one. Well, here's, here's, here's the phrase from this paper that I really love. Uh, uh, this is in the discussion. However, <laughs> and this is addressing this question, since none of the mammalian species that might be considered likely sources of contamination in a lab environment, mouse, rat, rabbit, guinea pig, appear to harbor truly REV-like viruses in exogenous or endogenous forms, whereas more exotic mammalian species do right. cross species transmission or contamination within the setting of the zoological park is an attractive hypothesis but yeah. you're, you're are, thinking of borneo right i am are there revs in borneo do we know this we don't, don't but even... we do know that this pheasant was hanging around in a zoo where it, this brings exotic species yeah, together sure. in a in oh. a small area with an opportunity uh, for, you know, to, to, to interact. I have a so question, I, though. Okay, I think go ahead, Reg. I just, I just think, you know, so the, the interesting hypothesis is the pheasant somehow uh, rubbed up against a mongoose, or <laughs> maybe there's, a, maybe there's a, a, an arthropod vector in between or something like sure. that. Yeah, yeah. And the pheasant picked up the REV, uh, which uh, contaminated the... Um, uh, 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 malaria stocks. So this is a Bronx Zoo crime scene investigation. <laughs> yeah. It is. So I, I'm going to raise some questions well, That's here. a good you, title. And you're, well, Why not? Because so, <laughs> you're going to have to answer this question. First of all, how recent an introduction to the zoo was the pheasant? Uh, that's a good question. They don't actually talk about that. And number two, I know that Bill Traeger was really interested in a wide variety of subjects and was... Um, I'm not sure if he was an official member or not, but I know he was at the New York Zoo. I got Zoo. the answer. Really? All right, so... What's the answer? This is from uh, the blog of uh, one of the authors. Um, mm. a scientist seeking a model organism examined some of the Southeast Asian birds that Crandall had imported to the New York Zoological Park a decade earlier. Decade. So these birds had been there for 10 years. So that, then that suggests that there was transmission at the zoo. They don't harbor this parasite for 10 years. I'm sorry. No? No way. Plus, the pheasant is from Borneo. No way. The mongoose is from Madagascar. No, I understand that. Right? But, yeah, yeah, right. But Lofuri right. can't exist as a parasitemia yeah. in a bird for 10 years. That's not going to happen. So the pheasant got it at the zoo, you're saying? Maybe. Well, where else would oh, okay. Well, oh, that's right. Where I else would it? got the malaria at the zoo. The yes. malaria, I mean, yeah. yeah. P. Lofuri was not a native infection of the bird. From Borneo, so Pilofuri might have come from another exotic introduction, right? From another place, and then got it through transmission cycle. Yeah, that's the crypt, one of the cryptic parts because we don't we don't know where Pilofuri comes from. <laughs> exactly right. right. Yeah, exactly right. right. So, so it picked up both Pilofuri and probably REV 
in the, the zoo. At the same time. At the same and time. And of course, the zoo is a perfect place, as Rich said. Yeah, but if there's right. a transmission cycle for P. Lofuri at the zoo, then uh, the virus could have already been associated with the parasite before in some yeah. other animal species. Do they keep old uh, pathological specimens from zoos? Well, I knew Tracy McNamara. Tracy McNamara was the zoo pathologist. Right. Uh, and the reason why I knew her is because of the West Nile virus outbreak. Right. Yeah, was that, was that uh, di- the Bronx Zoo was involved in that too, right? Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. You bet. She was, the off, one, right. she was the one that said you're dealing with two different things. Because if it's St. Louis encephalitis virus, birds don't die from it. Mm-hmm. And the original, original context of their diagnosis was based on serology, which cross-reacts very nicely with the uh, West Nile virus. So yeah. they said it must have been a different strain of St. Louis encephalitis. It can't be because our birds are dying from it. Yeah, that was, that was sharp. Very sharp. <laughs> and the pathologist in the New York State laboratories agreed with her which differentiated those two groups from the Centers for Disease Control with Dwayne Gubler, who was adamantly in favor of a St. Louis encephalitis yeah. virus story and, of course, failed. Good, good example of why serology, you have to be careful, right? Believe science, not scientists. And in this <laughs> case, boy, it was really true because the scientists, the, the, the physician scientists were not listening to the veterinary scientists, and they should have both collaborated. They didn't. And that resulted in misdiagnosis and a delay in the uh, in the uh, original description. Yeah. So, so here's another example of a zoonosis, <laughs> a true zoonosis at a zoo, a zoo that that originated from a place that we're totally un, unfamiliar with. Because if that pheasant has been in that zoo for ten years before they sampled it, that that pheasant caught that infection in the zoo recently and they were just lucky enough to catch it in that pheasant because it goes through this life cycle of you know two weeks five weeks ten weeks and then it's done so the implication is that both the parasitic and the virus infection occurred at the zoo correct right and and there's not necessarily an association between those two there could be yeah but there's not i mean i've wondered I mean, this is really far out, and there's no evidence for it. But I was—I've <laughs> right. wondered. Too bad the plasmodium is still around. I wonder if it's got an integrated copy. Yeah, of this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because remember, these um, parasites infect birds, and birds have nucleated red cells, and so there is the opportunity for even infecting the red cell nucleus of the virus itself and then carrying it this way for a while too because it's an integrated yep. retrovirus so that it might be in the nucleus of the red cells and the birds. So this is an example of iatrogenic transmission yeah. that is a medical procedure causes an infection right. and horizontal gene transfer here, here. between different virus families. Look at that. Retroviruses, <laughs> herpes viruses, and pox viruses. So now we have twiv and twim, uh, twip all together. <laughs> so Rich... I'm interested in how this retrovirus integrated into the pox mm-hmm. genome. For herpes, that's replicating in the nucleus, so that's where the retrovirus goes, the retroviral DNA goes. So that I can handle, but pox DNA is replicating in the cytoplasm. So is there ever um, a closed circular uh, retroviral DNA in the cytoplasm? I suppose, or is that yeah. all in the nucleus? I think the, the reverse transcription begins in the cytoplasm. And so there okay. is, it could be so there. So you, right. you could have retroviral DNA in the cytoplasm. Uh, also, you could, uh, uh, I suppose, you know, I've often wondered, and I've never really looked at this carefully, uh, I don't know whether pox viruses can infect cells undergoing mitosis. Mm-hmm. Under which circumstances there would not be a nuclear membrane. Yeah. So this, I look at this yeah. occasionally because I do a lot of immunofluorescence, right? And um, and I'm always looking in the DAPI stain for mitotic cells <laughs> because they're so cool looking. Yeah, they are. And right? I always look to see if those uh, have factories in them, and I have not seen one yet. Though I haven't, uh, I have an EM that I published some time ago that. Uh, looks as if uh, there's a cell that has it's, it's in an EM, so it's a little more difficult to see. It looks like they are uh, condensed chromosomes and a virus factory. So that's a circumstance where uh, you know you basically don't have a nucleus, okay? And the and there's uh, an opportunity for yeah, right. communication yeah. between the nuclear contents, what would be the nuclear contents, and, and the pox. But I can imagine a number of ways that this could happen. But initially, pox DNA does go in the nucleus, right? 
No. It doesn't at all? No. It's in the cytoplasm. So early on, well, this retroviral could, virus could have integrated at any time, starting from when the pox DNA is in the cytoplasm to in a factory, right? Yeah. Hmm. So another question is... But it would happen in the cytoplasm, unless the, yeah, nucleus, yeah, is, unless the nucleus is somehow degraded. Right, got do, it. do we know that this virus didn't or did integrate into the parasite's genome? We do no, not know. We don't know. The parasite's gone. I'm, I'm, the parasite's you know, I know that, gone. But I'm wondering what these uh, samples were that were transmitted from laboratory to laboratory. What was the nature of the sample? Was it whole uh, blood or was it isolated parasites? Stocks of, I don't know. That's a good question. I but don't know. What, it could what would be. You? Maybe REV was integrated into the P. Lofuri genome. That's what I'm suggesting. Yeah. In, the, in the 40s and 50s, <laughs> uh, in the 40s and 50s, uh, um, Dixon, if you were going to passage plasmodium, Using a uh, an animal model, what would be blood. the blood. material? Blood. Yeah, it's definitely blood because it's, this was not a vector transmitted thing. V uh, Bill Traeger didn't keep mosquitoes for that reason. Now uh, it is uh, it is known when they uh, ultimately sorted this out that uh, uh, I guess it was Traeger was able to uh, uh, using a filter separate the plasmodium from that's right. REV. That's so right. That's right. even if there was an integrated copy, there was sure. also free virus. Absolutely. Perhaps. Which, Which yeah. I think is probably the more reasonable thing. If this was actually the virus itself was amplifying on the uh, on the birds at the same time as the plasmodium, mm. right. but you don't know. No, Dixon, you don't. don't you think you could go to Rock and find some frozen <laughs> low fury stocks? You know, do you know what happens when somebody retires? They throw everything out. You betcha. Oh. They clear out their desk. They throw away their lab books. They throw away their samples. They throw away their slides. They throw away their freezer stocks, and they close the door, and they go home. I've been anticipating this. <laughs> well, I did it. But, Rich, you're going to give yeah. You're looking at somebody who did that. Well, Rich, you know, Rich is going to give you, away his virus. Richard, I'm going to tell you how painful that is. <laughs> well, it, I, I, you Watch your whole life flash before your eyes. Yeah, right. I figure I can probably condense my life into about a dozen freezer boxes. <laughs> right? well, uh, and everything else is going to go in the autoclave. Because the biosafety people have to check me out, right? Yeah. I was telling my wife this the other night. She says, what happens to all that data and equipment that you have when you retire? Who gets it? I said, nobody gets it. Nobody wants it. Uh, it the, depends. Uh, I have received strain collections from other people who have retired. No, that's that's different, and that takes up little amounts of space. But what do you do with that old, outdated equipment that you were what? using for oh, years, you just, and years and years? You have so a fire just, sale, and yeah, whatever, yeah, and sale. whatever. That's right. That's right. Whatever doesn't get uh, uh, whatever doesn't get stolen, you know, you just yeah, 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 yeah. give well, give to the archives. You know, Dixon, uh, as you know, our colleague Dave Figursky is retiring today. Yeah, is his last day. He's I been know. giving away everything for weeks. But of weeks. course, yeah. do you remember a scene out of a movie called Zorba the Greek? There was a scene where this old woman was dying. I think it was uh, Zorba's mother, as a matter of fact. And the law in Greece at that point said that whatever is given away before the death of the person is in the hands of whoever gets it. But once that person dies, the state owns everything. <laughs> <laughs> so this woman is laying in bed. You'll watch the scene maybe sometime. And she's breathing heavily and eventually... And the house is surrounded by villagers. And they're waiting for her last breath. And the moment she breathes her last breath, they strip the place bare. Yep. There's nothing yep. left. And that's what I thought of while I was busy disassociating myself from my life as a scientist, a re an active researcher, I should say. Boxes of slides, tons of data books, all memories of those past years, and you look through them and you start remembering. If you start doing that, you'll be there forever, so you have to get rid of it. Just back up, do not touch it, walk away from it, and uh, you'll be better off if you do. So there were, there were this story, by the way. And Traeger had to do that, by the way. Yes, I understand. This story, by the way, probably won't happen again because we can now sequence stocks and make right. sure that there isn't any contaminant. But it reminded me of. The XMRV story, which was a lab contaminant, yeah, Sendai, which made right. its way into many labs, Sendai virus. spread the iatrogenic spread of hepatitis C virus in Egypt uh -huh. for for by anti schistosome injections, and the spread of HIV in Africa yeah. by iatrogenic means, unclean uh, needles, and uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, which That's is right. from sheep to sheep to cows due go. to changes in the. Uh, uh, way that the uh, cows were fed. Yep. Sure. 
Um, I, a couple of more things. First of all, this is a PLOS One article, so it's open access, and people Plus can see it. PLOS Biology, uh, PLOS Biology, you're yep. right. Yep. And uh, the, the whole thing is, is summarized in this beautiful figure seven <laughs> yeah. uh, that gives a nice timeline of nice, uh, the, yeah. uh, everything that's going on. It's, it's, it's really nicely done. I'll so I, I want to, for a minute, segregate, if we can, mm -hmm. the, the facts from the supposition. Sure. So the, and see if I get this right. The fact is that this bird virus, REV, um, has remarkable sequence homology <laughs> to an endogenous mammalian retrovirus. So there's very little question, based on phylogenetic analysis, that this virus that's in birds originally came from a mammal. Right. All the viruses, all the REV sequences are consistent with a single introduction of a mammalian REV into right. birds. Right. And if you trace back in the literature the history of uh, the origins of REV, it tracks to this uh, plasmodium culture. Right. Okay? Right. Uh, so that's a fact as well. Right. The other fact is that uh, there's a uh, foul pox in nature uh, with REV in it. Uh, and there's evidence that REV had a hit and run encounter with uh, a gallant herpes virus uh, as well. Right. And the rest of it is kind of taking those pieces of information and putting together a story. Well, the other and fact the is that... Uh, in, in these mongooses that uh, have a, clearly a highly related REV, which was around millions of years ago. That's really what started all this right. off. The amazing, yep. the ability to date a long time ago the presence of an REV in a mammal. Right, yeah. right. Um, and so the most parsimonious uh, uh, explanation of all of that is that somehow... A mammalian REV uh, contaminated that uh, plasmodium stock, and 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 that may have happened in the zoo. That would be bring those uh, creatures together, uh, and uh, uh, possibly, perhaps likely, uh, during the uh, studies of foul pox and the um, uh, creation of vaccine strains. Uh, infected uh, REV integrated into a foul pox genome and was subsequently, uh, perhaps in vaccination campaigns, introduced into nature. Boom. Now the birds got it. That's it. Wow. Boy, it's too bad they didn't have, they didn't save Traeger's freezers. It really yeah. is. They could sort this out. What a story. There are some people still out there that have worked with Traeger <laughs> on this. Erwin uh, Sherman is one of them. Well, you worked with him. I did, well, I didn't work with him. No, I didn't. Okay, I sorry. Didn't. I was in his group, but I worked and with him. And Traeger, else. of course, died a number of years ago, right? Yes, yes. And yes. He lived a long life, though. He was 92, I think, when he finally did die. He was a wonderful man. I, I, I just can't stress enough how um, pleasurable it was to go into the lab every day and to uh, encounter not only uh, Dr. Traeger, but all the people that he attracted because that was the way to put it. He attracted right. wonderful, collaborative, interesting, uh, nice, uh, easy to get along with people. I, I don't know anybody that was an exception to that. Uh, there were some rather um, uh, eccentric people, okay, and I, I'm sure they would accept that term. Roxy Collegian was one of those ex eccentric people that worked with Bill Traeger, but she was still a very nice uh, and warm and... and uh, understanding person great great place to grow up as a scientist i'm glad you could be here dixon because you add some oh uh, yeah insight that we yeah, wouldn't well, have had well, well you always we, aren't do. done, we aren't done with you yet either because i got a pick for you i've been saving for you oh dear <laughs> let's read a couple of emails uh rich i think you should take this first one from marcia uh, yeah i really got tangled up in this <laughs> uh oh in a good way I, I really had a good time with this so uh marcia writes i've got a history question for you of sorts i'm trying to track down the history of epstein Barr virus ebv testing. Uh, testing when i do an internet search however most of the results are for current ebv testing methods so i think i need some help from you guys 
parenthesis guys, of course, here, including <laughs> both senses, <laughs> both sexes, no exclusion intended. <laughs> I'm trying to find evidence to support or perhaps disprove a claim that a certain Myron Wentz developed the first commercially available test for EBV, probably in the 70s. Most of the information I'm finding is from Dr. Wentz's various companies, which raises a red flag for me. But in the process of trying to research this, I became interested in the topic in a more general sense. In 1969, shortly after I went away to college for the first time, I came down with a severe case of mononucleosis. Yeah, sure. From what I can tell, it seems definitive testing may not have been around at that point. Yeah. So my curiosity is connected to some personal past history. I found TWIV during the uh, XMRV hoo-ha a couple of years ago <laughs> since I've had chronic fatigue syndrome for many years. I've been a regular TWIV listener ever since and enjoy listening to your informal discussions about virology and science in general. Anyway, I'd love to hear about the history of testing for Epstein-Barr virus, if you know anything about it, or if not, maybe an expert on that would be an interesting future guest on your show. Uh, P.S. I donated blood to one of the WPI studies and tested positive for XMRV. In retrospect, we now know that wasn't particularly useful information since it was probably contamination in the lab. Oh, well, on to the next study. <laughs> okay, so I got into this. Uh, I didn't know anything about testing for EBV. And so I did some looking into it. Um, let me first say that Epstein-Barr virus is a herpes virus uh, of humans. It's a gamma herpes virus. Uh, and so uh, it uh, infects uh, through the initially the epithelium, I think, uh, and, but ultimately endogenizes uh, B lymphocytes and uh, hangs out there uh, forever. <clears throat> and most people, under normal circumstances, get... Uh, infected at a very young age, within the first five years of life, it uh, has a, uh, in, in most places, almost everybody, over 90% of people are seropositive and carry a uh, latent infection with EBV. And if you're infected as a child, uh, the infection is uh, asymptomatic. Uh, if your uh, encounter with EBV is delayed until um, your, say, early to mid-teens, um, then you become, if you are, are uh, infected with uh, EBV, um, you can develop uh, infectious mononucleosis, which is uh, uh, characterized by a proliferation, actually, of T-cells. Um, and basically, it's a, a sort of an anemia condition. Um, uh, as a result of that T cell pl uh, proliferation, but lots of stuff happens uh, to your immune cell compartment during infectious mononucleosis. I should say that EBV is also associated with a number of B cell lymphomas, including Burkitt's. nasopharyngeal carcinoma, Burkitt's lymphoma, mm -hmm. and uh, a couple of others. So that's EBV. Normally, not a big deal. Uh, by the way, uh, this um, uh, to me is one of the things I use to say that, you know, well, eat dirt, yes, but kiss a lot of people <laughs> at a very young age, you know? Kiss your children. Suck on their pacifiers, okay? <laughs> so at any rate, I didn't know anything about this, but if you'll recall, a few episodes ago, um, I, as a pick of the week, chose a book called To Catch a Virus, oh. uh, which is a history of diagnostic virology, which I liked very much. And so I wrote hmm. the author. John Boos, I think is how you might pronounce his name. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. B double O double S. And uh, I wrote him just yesterday, and he wrote me right back. It was terrific. Wow. And he says, Your questioner's query about EBV and his personal timing are of interest. Until the end of the 60s, when your questioner became sick, the, di the, sick, the diagnosis of mono was dependent on clinical presentation, mm -hmm. the blood smear, uh, and heterophile antibodies, Heterophile. including the monospot assay, and I'll come back to that. The section on infectious mononucleosis in the fourth edition of APHA's Diagnostic Procedures for Viral and Rickettsial Infections emphasizes the heterophile agglutination assay and its variants. And in fact, I think this is still the frontline 
test, I guess, because it's easy. Mm -hmm. Uh, The heterophile assay was not EBV specific. Antigen specific antibodies for EBV were defined by Henley's group at the Children's Hospital of, is that uh, CHOP? Is that Philadelphia? Philadelphia. Uh, and others in the latter half of the 60s. Jim Niederman in New Haven working with Henleys, with the Henleys demonstrated the association of clinical mono with serological conversion for EBV in Yale College students in 68. Uh, so the uh, notion that EBV actually caused mononucleosis wasn't until uh, just a year before our writer got sick. With apologies, I can't determine which companies or persons brought these assays into commercial production. The use of cloned DNA probes and PCR would soon follow. And then he says, uh, Alex uh, uh, Sellis, T-S-E-L-I-S, has a very nice uh, history chapter in his book, Epstein-Barr Virus, that he co-edited with Hal Jensen in 2006. Uh, And he copied uh, Alex, and Alex wrote to me as well and said, I don't recognize the name Wentz. The EBV antigens, VCA, EA, and EBNA, were being defined in the late 60s and early 70s, so the current EBV panel did not exist in 1969. VCA, that is viral capsid antigen, was discovered uh, in the Henley lab in 66, EA in the Henley lab in 70, and EBNA by George Klein in 73. These are all viral proteins. So no doubt uh, the EBV panel existed before 73. Okay, so uh, then I, uh, there's a wiki entry on Myron Wentz. And in this particular case, uh, I would want to look further than wiki. Uh, it says, in 1974, Wentz lost, launched Gull Laboratories as a one-man operation and developed a test for diagnosing Epstein-Barr virus infection. Wentz sold his controlling interests in Gull Laboratories in 92 and founded USANA Health Sciences in the same year. And then, by gum, looking around a little more, I found a paper called Evaluation of 12 Commercial Tests for Detection of Epstein-Barr <laughs> Virus-Specific and Heterophile Antibodies. And one of the test kits that they use is Wentz's kit from Gull Laboratories. So, How did it rank? Uh, it did okay. Oh, good. They say, quote, our results indicate that the test for VCA IgG, so these are, mm. remember the tests, uh, pr- prior tests were for heterophile antibody, uh, which is not EBV specific. These later kits are for specific, uh, abno- uh, or specific EBV antigens. So, and this is one of those. Indicate the test for VGA, VCA IgG and EBNA IgG from the Gull Laboratories. May have problems with specificity. Previous evaluations have shown that the Gull ELISAs for VCA and IgM and IgG both have high sensitivity and specificity, but the EBNA IgG test has low sensitivity and needs improvement. It has also been proposed to use a combination of the VCA, IgM, and IgG test from Gull and the EBNA IgG test from Biotest. Such a combination could perhaps be considered close to an optimal test kit. But for use in practical virological diagnostics, there is a need for further investigations. And they have comments on a bunch of other tests as well. So, this uh, 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 Wentz, uh, and actually, if you look at the wit, uh, wiki entry, yes, it was the Gull Laboratories was a one-man operation. Uh, so, uh, he did invent a viable, apparently, or manufacture, develop a viable uh, um, EBV a specific test that was commercialized. I think the only piece of data missing is whether or not it was the first, as is claimed in our writer's letter, and I can't answer that. Mm-hmm. Uh, the only other thing I would say is that heterophile antibody is interesting. The EBV infection uh, induces uh, an antibody response to something, uh, and I'm not clear what it is. I'm not sure if anybody's clear what it is. Uh, that is not EBV specific. It is also not a self antigen, but the antibodies react with uh, horse red blood cells. Uh, so uh, the serum from an EBV infected uh, individual or a person with a mononucleosis that is a severe EBV infection will agglutinate horse red blood cells, and that's the monospot assay. Is that, why it's it's called, not, is that why it's called a heterophile? Yes. Okay, okay, so file it likes 
hetero something different. Yeah, yep. Of you know? yep. 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 Good job, um, Rich. Well, like I said, I got into it. CSI. <laughs> More CSI. That's right. All right. I hope that uh, Marsha likes that answer. It involved a lot of people. Yeah, and I really want to thank um, those people for writing me back so quickly. That's that was great. terrific. Yeah. Nice. I have to read that book. It's on my list. You liked it's it. Book. You liked it's it. a good yeah. book. Yeah. I liked it, yeah. Uh, next one is from Eric, who writes, Hello, Twiv. I'm a first year in the biochemistry and molecular biology department at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Recently, I was fortunate enough to learn about the new Public Health United podcast being produced by a friend, Nina Martin, in the microbiology department here at the School of Public Health. I was delighted to learn that you will be participating in this podcast later this year. <laughs> I am eagerly awaiting this episode and look forward to hearing your perspectives on communicating science to the general pub public, a critical and often overlooked aspect of academic research. But we kind of dropped that, didn't we, Rich? Uh, which was that? We were supposed to do a podcast, all of us, with these uh, individuals at uh, Hopkins who do their own podcast, an epi podcast. Oh, I guess I didn't. Uh, it, that kind of uh, shot over my head or something like that. Yeah, I think you, I were, uh, you were involved in the emails, I think. Hmm, it was okay. We were supposed to do it in June, so it never happened. But So let's reboot that. We'll it reboot could happen. It. It's we'll reboot still it. happen. Uh, also, I would like to comment on a textbook someone mentioned a few twivs back. Essential. Uh, wait, wait, hold, hold it, hold it. Yep. This is at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. Right. Correct. That's where Vera is going to be. Ah. When I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be there in October. In October. I yeah. mean, that's pretty short notice. Well, uh, so we that's okay for them, I think. But let's boot it up and see if, and I'll come down if. Uh, uh, third and fourth. VRA is three and four. Okay. Okay. It, it, you should find the email. You can dig it out. Or I'll do it too. Uh, yeah, I don't, boy, I don't know. <laughs> okay. We were going to do it by Skype, so it doesn't matter. Ah. But true. if you're there, it, that's okay. Uh, so, Essential Cell Biology by Bruce Alberts. This was the book used in my undergrad cell bio class at Shippensburg University of Pennsylvania. I found it to be at the perfect introductory level. Now I'm familiar with Albert's molecular biology of the cell, or Fat Albert's, as my professor used to call it, <laughs> in, in comparison with the Smaller Essentials book. And it provides a nice graduate-level complement to the Essentials book. Thanks from partly cloudy 15 degrees Celsius, Baltimore. <laughs> Thank you, Eric. Cool. All right. Rich. CN writes, Greetings again. Was listening to your TWIV 231. The discussion about GBVC was interesting. This virus is also uh, being studied by many groups and is a uh, possibility of use against HIV since it is known to interfere with HIV. I have blogged a little about it last year. Um, and he cites a review in Trends in Microbiology. Could be a possible TWIV podcast. Excellent uh, TWIV topic. Excellent po podcasts. Twix fan. The name of this article is GB Virus C, the good boy virus, question mark. <laughs> so it does interfere with HIV. So people are trying to figure out why and maybe it could be useful. Yeah. Maybe we'll, we, we could do that one yeah, time. Sure. Interesting. Sure. Why we'll not? Put it on our list, right? Yeah. Next one's from Pradi, who writes Dear TWIV members, I'm a PhD student of molecular virology studying respiratory syncytial virus with my mentor, Dr. Umens, at Oklahoma State University. Listening to your podcast the last couple of years, they helped me a lot during my qualifying exam for PhD candidate. Here I'm sending you an article about the role of virologists in the real world. You might have read this or already discussed this issue previously, but I wanted to point out this again, particularly in today's world of confusion created by overambitious media and social network websites. I also believe that along with current virologists, current virology students also have the responsibility to educate the general public about science in general and viruses in particular. I hope to hear about this issue in your discussion. Thank you very much and appreciate all the good work you are doing. So he sent an article. Well, obviously, we, we're interested in science communication here on TWIV. Get Political, the Case for Greater Vi Virological Leadership. Basically saying, 
virologists need to speak out. Right. And in clear terms. You know, a lot of virologists don't, but that's a science thing. A lot of scientists don't speak out. I mean, traditionally, right, Dixon, you never spoke out to the general public. Certainly not about viruses. No, about anything. (laughs) That's not true. Did you speak to the press? I've never refused an interview as long Mm. as I knew I could communicate something. If I thought I didn't have something to add to it, I refused the interview. But otherwise, I I was very willing to do that. I mean, in this article, they cite the uh, Wakefield... Uh, MMR debacle and saying that virologists failed to challenge it appropriately. I even testified in Congress once. So um, I challenged the Times article last week. Right. And uh, one of my colleagues here said, why are you bothering? Just ignore it. No. But I think this is an example of (laughs) an old school view of things. You can't ignore it. The public thinks that whatever the papers write is true and and if it's not, if you see something wrong, you have to speak up. And the internet now and the social media uh, really facilitates this kind of thing. It makes it a lot, uh, a lot easier to, uh, you know, communicate on your own. You don't need, you that's don't right. need somebody else to help you. Yeah, you can have a blog and stuff like this. Right. That's right. I mean, that's the first thing I did. I wrote a blog, and I have, I mean, I've built up a nice following, and people read it and comment and so forth and if everyone where a lot of people were doing this not everyone's going to blog would really help i always make the point that each of us has to do something to communicate it's also a lot easier now to uh i mean you contacted the the writer directly okay right just as i just i mean similarly contacted the author of that book that this kind of stuff the sort of communication and interaction is a lot easier than it used to be. And, yeah, uh, you know, a lot of people are, are quite willing to interact with you. Sometimes you have to take the initiative. Right. So, it's good. Yep. Rich, you're next. All right. Uh, Jim writes, this is our friend uh, Jim in Virginia. I've recently tumbled into a bunch of medical podcast sites where lots of talk is going on about foam and I wanted to make sure it was on your radar stream, uh, screen. So foam, and he gives a link. Um, I'm blanking on this. Foam is uh, free open access medical education. And that looks like a, a whole bunch of different links uh, and blogs put into one spot. Kathy was looking at this and came across one of them. Uh, you know, Kathy had looked over this, anticipating we were going to go over these emails last week, and found a, a, a really cool little video that I looked at on how to remove a ring without bolt cutters. <laughs> so from a bunch of uh, yeah, from someone's uh, finger, you mean? <laughs> yeah, a bunch of a uh, bunch of docs talking about you know trying to yeah. uh, remove rings from people's hands. It's very good. At any rate, that looks like a great. Cool. And it's also in English, French, German, Italian, Polish, Spanish, and Turkish. Wow. So you've got tabs at the top you can click on and see it in different languages. That's pretty cool. That's what I always wanted to do that with with our stuff. Hmm. Barnacle that's, encrusted that's stumps remain. Thrust, thrusting vertebral fossils from tidal glar pools and rising silt. It's a poem. I'll say. <laughs> nice. That's <laughs> kind of like the, the medical jabberwocky. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you, Jim. Uh, the next one is from Rohan. Isn't that a place in Lord of the Rings? Uh, yes. Come on, The writers Dixon, of Rohan, you, yes. You, you didn't read Lord of the Rings? Nope. Dixon. Dixon, you have work to do. It's a great trilogy. <laughs> no, huh? Not I mean, Dixon. Head. Dixon, I will read it out loud. <laughs> <laughs> the writers of Rohan. <laughs> Hi there, Twivologist. I'd like to introduce myself as Rohan, working as a research assistant at the University of Madras, India. Yes. I first came across virology.ws when I enrolled for my master's degree and have been in love with it ever since. I very much enjoy the weekly Twiv, Twip, and Twim podcasts. What weekly Twip? (laughs) Well. There isn't any. (laughs) We call it that, but it's probably. I happen to listen to Twiv 230, and I have a few doubts regarding patenting, hence this mail. As part of my dissertation work during my master's program, I worked on development of a serologic diagnostic method for dengue. 
My aim was to devise a specific and cheap diagnostic technique for dengue that can distinguish it from other flavivirus-caused diseases that are prevalent in India, J.E. West Nile. That's when I came across a paper where they showed that human IgM antibodies against the NS5 protein of West Nile virus could effectively distinguish it from other flaviviruses, apart from the fact that they used recombinant NS5 proteins in a microsphere-based assay. The basic principle appealed to me, and I decided to apply a simplified version of the method for dengue. And so he describes what he did here to uh, separate the proteins and, and try and, and do this. After some searching, I came to know that I should have used a different substrate instead of what he used. And then he asked, I would like to get your opinion as to what might have gone wrong other than the substrate thing and whether there are any chances <laughs> that I might be able to get conclusive results if suitable changes are done. This may sound stupid, but do you think, uh, do you think there are any chances for me to patent this method if things turn out well eventually? The reason I'm so interested in pursuing this is that if successful, it has potential to be a cheap and specific diagnostic for dengue in the rural sectors of India where the disease claims many lives every year. Currently used ELISA kits are based on detection of IgM antibodies against structural proteins and sometimes, if not often, nonspecific and give false negatives. Please note that I have not mentioned the work with the antibodies in the same as I couldn't get conclusive results from it. Hope to hear from you twivologists soon. I don't know anything about being able to patent it, and I'll bet, uh, bet Rich I, I, wouldn't either. Uh, no, I wouldn't either, except <laughs> that uh, there's, uh, you know, there's got to be something special and unique about it that nobody has come up with yet, right? Yeah. Um, so, sounds like there's a lot of, uh, it, it, it can't be obvious, right? Yeah, so uh, if, you, if you make a method based on another method, you will have to pay royalties to them in, if you would like to commercialize yours. So, you know, every company, when they develop something, tries to find some unique intellectual property, and so this might be problematic. But, you know, as, you for should, whether you, not you, as for whether or not you can make it work, yeah, sure, probably. Yeah, yeah you, just, you always have to troubleshoot. It's always something, and, you know, right. we can't really help because we're not there and looking at the data. But just change things. Make up a new buffer. <laughs> titrate. <laughs> titrate. 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 <laughs> um, we do have dengue interested people listening. We have lawyers listening. So, by the way, they can chime in. We now have uh, an outbreak of dengue in the United States. Where? In Where's Florida. That? I thought it was in Florida. Is it a new one? I think so. Huh. What do you mean you think? I think I read that recently because they discovered Aedes aegypti in Florida. It's been reintroduced. It hadn't been there? That's right. They eliminated it from the United States at one point. Here we go. Dengue. Eight cases of dengue detected in Florida. Yeah. CNN, two days ago. Bingo. I, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to have to contact Sharon. <laughs> so public health education. <laughs> so, yeah. you know. Hades so, aegypti. Yeah, See we, it? It's not, it's not a common occurrence in the United States. That's right. <laughs> But there's another one called Aedes albopictus, which is the Asian tiger mosquito, which has been busy displacing Aedes aegypti niches. All right, it's in competition with uh, Aedes aegypti, and that's the reason why uh, reintroducing Aedes aegypti is difficult, I think, because of the presence now of the Asian tiger mosquito. But nonetheless, here is an example. How many cases was that, Rich? Just two. Eight. Oh, eight. I'm sorry, eight. So uh, is eight. this? This uh, is as of. August 20, this is a, a CNN um, uh, article from August 28, 2013. So the fact that the virus vector is there doesn't mean the virus is there. How did dengue get there? Uh, we, there are, uh, as I understand it, uh, there is now some endogenous dengue in Florida. Really? Uh, that was initially imported. And so when dengue shows up, and you can tell this phylogenetically, uh, I'm reaching for this, but I, I, I think I got this right. When dengue shows up, you can uh, do a phylogenetic analysis, and you can now distinguish between imported cases uh, and endogenous cases. So where they there is from? Dodge, where, where they come from, yeah. I don't know. Other India? islands? Maybe India. I'm not sure. Caribbean islands. No, but they, you have immigration from other places, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, There's a lot of, we got a lot of traffic in Florida. You do? So, you yeah. actually do. So uh, I will uh, I will uh, email our buddy from Florida Gulf Coast University, Sharon Isern, about this because mm -hmm. I'm sure she'll have all the details. The last outbreak I knew about was down in um, Texas. 
it was an outbreak in 2009 in Florida also. Uh, yeah, they say 2009-2010, uh, officials documented 28 locally acquired cases in Key wow. West. Right. Wow, wow. All right. Oh, look, the next one is mm -hmm. about is from a, a dengue. <laughs> Our friend dengue, Richard, uh, who is at the Dengue Vaccine Initiative in Korea. Uh -huh. Rich, that's yours, right? <laughs> Richard writes, Dear Twiv Heroes, yes indeed, I am writing concerning your comments about patents and the production of products in developing countries such as That's China and India. That's a great follow-up. What a wonderful follow-up letter. <laughs> this is an area in which I've had a great deal of interest for a long time. Patents are issued by national governments and apply only in countries in which they are issued. Mm -hmm. Because of the large expense of filing for and maintaining patents, most inventors choose only to file in those countries where they think there might be a profitable market for invention. Right. Thus, most pharmaceutical companies file patents only in the United States, European countries, Japan, and Australia. Mm -hmm. This applies for both drugs and vaccines. Therefore, <clears throat> most drugs and vaccines are not patented in China and India, although this is slowly changing. Companies in China and India have complete freedom to copy products patented in other countries and are not breaking any laws or infringing any patents. They are not allowed to sell the products in the countries where the inventor has obtained a patent. Right. The production of important drugs and vaccines in China and India and other developing countries such as Brazil has proven to be a wonderful mechanism to help ensure that the poor in developing countries have access to modern health technologies. Yeah. This is robustly seen with respect to vaccines. An old example is the development and marketing of hepatitis B vaccines by Korean manufacturers, although they did, although they did use unique technologies. Their efforts dramatically lowered the cost of hepatitis his B vaccine and led the way for poor people in developing countries to have access to this wonderful vaccine. Coming to today, it seems that Indian manufacturers will play a similar role with respect to rotavirus vaccine and the pneumococcal vaccine and a Brazilian manufacturer with respect to dengue vaccine. Patents are important mechanisms to spur innovation and need to be observed and supported where they are in force. If an inventor chooses not to file a patent application in certain countries, it is perfectly acceptable for com companies in those countries to produce the product. I've been a listener to TWIV since the first edition and can't wait each week for the next. You're doing a fantastic job and your skills continue to grow and make the podcast extremely valuable and enjoyable. Thank you for your wonderful efforts, Rich. And he is in the, we've heard from Rich before. He's with the Dengue Vaccine Initiative in Seoul, Korea. Wow. So what a wonderful letter. That's very nice and very informative. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, the um, previous, Rohan can learn from this because if sure. the technology he's worried about is not patented in India, he can go ahead and do as he wishes yeah. there, right? Right. That's right. All right, let's do the last one, which is just a link from our friend Ricardo in Portugal. It's a cool thing called a vac stamp. Hmm. And this is uh this actually takes a long time to load. Okay, it is from a company called Yanko Design, and it is basically a way to vaccinate kids without needles. You know, it is, um, it's probably some micro needle yeah. kind of a. It, There's it, a cross section of it down here somewhere. Yeah. I think. Uh, uh, maybe it's under another tab. So, oh, no, you can see it in this. Yeah, micro needle. Yeah. Blah, blah, blah. You can see it. Yeah, so there it is in the cross section. It's just tiny needles. They don't hurt. And then they leave the impression of a heart on the baby afterwards. <laughs> Isn't that cute? It's the happiest damn baby I've ever seen. <laughs> Very happy. Happy mommies, happy babies. Everybody's happy. Everybody's happy. happy. Baby has yeah. a little heart on his or her, her shoulder. And the baby's not screaming and crying because they have needles here next to them, long, sharp needles. <laughs> so that's pretty cool. They have one for diphtheria, measles, hepatitis B here. So that's very well. Cute. And in fact, in fact, that would be a, a real boon if that were used regularly because I, I think here, a big here. barrier to vaccination is the fact that you have to get these injections. People don't like that. I don't that's blame true. them. They don't want to see their kids, uh, you know, hurt. Plus, or, in, yeah. in less than sanitary conditions, you can transmit other things that way too. Mm-hmm. 
yeah, this this will come to pass for sure. This technology is really great. moving along here. Great. So that will be cool. All right. How about some picks of the week? Oh, he's shaking his head. Dixon, I'm sorry you can't leave the room without a pick. <laughs> You sit there and think while Rich and I... Well, I do have a pick of you. You can include that. And this has nothing to do with the virology, of course, but I just downloaded the latest Google Universe. It's fine. You can pick and that. And I love that. I mean, I just... That's fantastic. So is it something new? Apparently. So, that yeah, I went to the NASA website and they said that we have a new Google updated edition of Hubble Space Telescope. So they have the entire universe as we know it. Okay. And you can zoom in on any object... Uh, using this app, or it's not an app, it's just, a, it's just a downloadable thing, and it's all free, and you get these spectacular Hubble Space Telescope pictures of the object located in the area of cool. the universe that you, you know, want to put things in context. That's my pick of the week. You see, Dixon, <coughs> every, every time you come up with something, you first shake your head no, well, I, you know, and then you've always got something because you're interested in science. Well, I am. So I found something, and I think is what Dixon is talking about, and I will paste it in here, and you can let me know if it's the right thing. So this is something you you got for your desktop computer. Yeah, you can just go to the NASA website, and it it has the uh, Google. Okay, we'll find it. Thank you, Dixon. Uh, Was he about to leave? He can't leave. I'm not leaving. No, he's not leaving. I'm not leaving. (laughs) uh, Let's just make sure this is it. Yeah. Does this look like it, Dixon? From here it does, because I can't see anything. Stars from here, and from here. galaxies. Yeah, yeah, no, that's the point. And then it's zoomable. You can actually zoom in on areas. It's called Google Sky. That's Google the Sky. Is that Google? it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Rich, what do you have? All right. Are you paying attention, Dixon? <laughs> I'm here. I'm, I'm all ears. Uh, on the recommendation of a friend of mine, I watched a movie some time ago. It's a documentary called The Vanishing of the Bees. Ah. This takes us back to... Uh, our episodes on colony collapse disorder. Yep, yep. And this is a documentary on colony collapse disorder. Now, yep. I have to say that uh, I these uh, the uh, authors of this film have, I would say, a bias. <laughs> uh, but it's uh, it could be that they're biased in the in the right direction, and I will back that up with a couple of things. There's a little. Uh, uh, a, a popular science article called Science Discover What's Killing the Bees and It's Worse Than You Thought and a reference to a PLOS One paper that basically the, the, the theme here is that uh, certain uh, crop pesticides right. uh, are That's right. at least partially to blame uh, for the colony collapse disorder. In this right. particular PLOS article it's saying that uh, 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 these uh, pesticides uh, alter the susceptibility to a, a, a gut pathogen. But the documentary itself uh, gave me insights into the bee industry uh-huh. that I didn't have before that are really very interesting. Okay? Right, right. So it's not, it's not just the, uh, uh, the pesticides. I think that a significant problem with this whole thing is it seems to be monoculture. Right. Okay. Oh, I see so, where this is going. So, <laughs> so, just for example, ninety percent of the almonds sold in the world yeah, they come, come from, from California. That's correct. In these huge near Fresno. Yeah, in these huge orchards. That's right. That do nothing but grow almonds. And not okay? only that, Rich, they flood irrigate. And since that's all they do. The bees can't live there right. because there's nothing else for the bees to That's use right. That's right. except when the almonds are flowering. So they got to import the bees. There so what go. do they do? They cultivate <laughs> the bees in Florida, right. and they load them in these hives That's on right. trucks That's and right. truck them across the U.S., stress them feeding out. them, feeding them uh, corn syrup on sure. the way across. <laughs> exactly okay? right. Uh, exactly and then right. plunk down the hives, yeah, and you then got the bees, the... which are like, totally disoriented, right. go and do their thing with the almonds, and then they truck the bees back to Florida. That's true. And then a little later, they truck them up to Maine to do right. the blueberries. The blueberries that's right. And on the way home, they stop off in Connecticut to do the yeah. strawberries. Got it. No wonder the bees are whacked. You got okay? it. Okay. And they winter uh, over so, in Texas. They winter so over in if Texas. You, uh, if you combine all of that with, I mean, there's lots of things going on here, but I thought yep. that that was fascinating. And uh, apparently, 
uh, there's a, a correlation, at least in time, between the introduction of certain systemic pesticides and uh, uh, colony collapse disorder. So there's some suspicion that pesticides are a contributing factor in all this. Yeah. I thought one of the most interesting things about this, I mean, clearly some of the agricultural uh, practices uh, uh, contribute to this, but I thought one of the most interesting perspectives on this was one of the beekeepers say, uh, basically, that the bees are like the canary in the mine. Yep. These are these are sentinel organisms that are telling us that there's something wrong. Here, here. Okay, at, that we need to pay some attention to. Yeah, so right. it's, it's a fun documentary. So, Dixon, it, these are all uh, bees that are grown in hives, domestic right? Domestic bees. But right. what about wild bees? Are there? And there sure, there's lots of those. And where do, they don't live in hives, obviously. No, no, no. Are they collapsing? Uh, that's a good question, actually, uh, because they're not tracking those, of course. Uh, so it's hard to know. Uh, you've seen, but you know what happens when they discover a hive of bees in your house? You know what happens, right? You, you hire an exterminator and they yeah, kill them sure. all. So uh, there are very few domestic colonies of bees that are not commercial because of that. Because uh, if you look at where these farms are, I mean, they're, they're very close, at least mm. where we live, not where Rich is, but uh, where we live. Uh, New Jersey is called the Garden State. There's still a lot of farming goods that goes on in New Jersey. Uh, of the 100 top crops that are grown, they estimate that like uh, 70 of them require pollination. So there's a lot of beekeeping. In fact, they just reintroduced beekeeping in Brooklyn. They, they eliminated a law which says you can't keep bees in Brooklyn because of the older agricultural laws that, that kicked farming out of the city. It's now all coming back into the city. <laughs> so there are these reversals of fortune, as you might say. But, Rich, did you read how much money they make uh, keeping bees? Uh, no, but it's, I can imagine it's, it's in not the billions. Pretty. It's in the billions. Uh -huh. Because the major uh, uh, truck crops depend upon these uh, colonies. So it's a huge problem to try to solve. And, and, and I think so, and in, in Europe, you, you can find out which pesticides are at stake here by just looking at the ones that are not no longer in use in Europe because Europe doesn't have the same control systems that we do. Uh, in this country, we are still saying, well, more studies are needed to find out if that's right. crap. You know, So if more studies are needed, why not stop using it until you find out whether it's doing it or not and then reintroduce it if it's not doing it. Which but is we what don't, they're doing. It's the opposite. Doing no, we, yeah. Here, we have to prove right. that it's doing something wrong before it's taken off the market. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Europe, they'll take it off the market and then if it if it's safe, they'll put it back on again. So, But not every colony of bees is schlepped all over the country, clearly. Some of them are static, right? Some, but uh, like for the ones in Montana, for instance, they they keep them there. And those are also in decline, right? Oh, yeah. So, this But is they not use pesticides a, there, too, though. Yeah. So, I mean, and then just, we know there are mites and viruses uh, that yeah, could be involved. Sure. Right? I mean, think about this. They use pesticides like crazy to knock down the, the insects that come in and eat the crops, and then they expect bees to be able to survive that. It's another insect. Its physiology is the same. Right. So, you know, it's kind of a stupid thing for them to get involved with like that, I think. They're not thinking about it, and uh, they need to do more thinking. All right, my pick of the week is a blog by a fellow named Ed Young, and it's called... Not exactly rocket science. It's hosted over at National Geographic, and um, Ed is a writer, science writer in the UK. And I've known Ed for quite a while. He often sends me articles for comment. And in fact, he had sent me this week the reticuloendotheliosis virus <laughs> article uh, for my comment. And he's just a wonderful writer. He writes he sure is. all sorts of things in a really interesting way. Mm -hmm. I'd put him online with like Carl Zimmer in terms of really being a clear and creative science writer. So And Alan Dove. And Alan Dove. <laughs> That's right. So um, this is one place that he writes. If you go there, you will find links to his other uh, works as well. But I see he's got a uh, uh, an article here on sea otters. I studied those when I was an undergraduate. Mm. Cute little animals. And you know what the biggest threat to them are, don't you? Uh, the uh, abalone fishermen. No, toxoplasmosis. Oh, is that right? Really? Yeah. Well, when yeah. I when I uh, thirty forty years ago, it was the abalone fishermen. Right. 
uh, well, Toxo. Uh, well, here's the reason. Oh, Richard, that's a wonderful segue. And actually, no, initially, no, no, listen, listen. Uh, go ahead. Initially, <laughs> it was the uh, it was they were nearly wiped out by the Russian fur trade. Yeah, that's right. This is a fantastic okay. connection here. So you're right. The abalone fishermen eliminated the primary diet of the sea otter, uh-huh. so they switched. The sea otters have to eat. So what do you think they f- they fed on after that? Uh, well, they eat a lot of urchins, snails. Ah, and the snails, and the snails have toxo. Ate, yes, and they, <laughs> they didn't have toxo before that, even though there was still as much contamination of their estuarian environments as there is now from cat runoff, which comes from the fields in Salinas, California, by the way. Oh, be darn. Yeah, so feral cats, <laughs> toxo, runoff. Sea urchins and snails. No, forget the sea urchins. I didn't mean to say that. And uh, the lack of abalone forces the sea otters to eat snails. The snails contain the cysts, the oocysts from toxo, and they uh, come down with it, and they can't resist it, and they die. So there, right. are, there are patches of missing sea otters along the coast of the, uh, of the western coast, and you can trace them all back to agricultural runoff and the depletion of uh, abalone. Amazing tie-ins. Cool. Amazing time. Well, Ed Young is a great writer. I really enjoy these blogs. They're good. Great. We have a listener pick from Syra, who is from a PhD student in the Aga Khan University in Karachi, okay. and writes, I trust all is well. Everything well? Uh, and vice versa, by the way, <laughs> considering where that is. Pakistan. This is Syra from Karachi, Pakistan. I've been listening to TWIV for quite a while now. Needless to say, it has not helped me a great deal in developing an interest in virology in general. I never knew one day I would be so fascinated with viruses and would be looking <laughs> forward so much to listening to a podcast all about viruses. Hey. My favorite part of TWIV is the listener's pick of the week. <laughs> I've always enjoyed going through the picks, and today I'm sending my pick for your and others' interest. It's called the Reproducibility Initiative, taken up by a number of scientific organizations to validate and publish reproduced results. I think it's validate and reproduce published results. I'm sure you will take a look at this website, and he gives a link. He or she gives a link. I don't know what that name would be. Sarah. I thought it would be a good choice for a listener's pick. I hope you will share it with other listeners in case it hasn't been featured. It will be great to listen to your thoughts about it. I want to congratulate the entire team of TWIV and thank each one of you profs individually for your time, effort, and dedication towards educating young and aspiring graduate students like me. So the Reproducibility Initiative is, I think it's a tough one. They are trying to get money together for independent groups to validate certain studies that are published in scientific journals Mm -hmm. by a third party. Mm -hmm. And this is hard because (laughs) they have to raise money for it, first of all. They do have an advisory board. They probably – and you have to pay for it. Right. Or you have to pay to have your work validated. So if you think mm. it's it's important, you sh- I just don't think this is going to work. Mm. This might Tough be. One. What, mm. I mean, we, it's a nice idea to try and validate things, but I think science in its in the end always corrects itself, right? I agree yeah. with that actually. So I'm not sure we need this. It's a haphazard process, but it happens. There's clearly problems with reproducibility. A lot of science is not yeah. reproducible, but if it's important in, in the end. Uh, many scientists will work on it, and yep. you'll know the answer, right? That's right. That's right. So, Syra is a female name. Thank you, Syra, and thank you, Rich. It's a very nice name. I like it. Yeah, yeah, it is nice. Syra. All right, before we wrap up, I just want to tell everyone that a microbiologist from Yale University has been picked by President Obama yes, to be the right. Associate Director for Science at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. Outstanding. This is the person you've had on uh, uh, TWIM, right? That's right. This is <laughs> Joe Handelsman, who uh, works on uh, microbiology. She's a microbiologist. Now she is interested in microbiomes. And she uh, is a wonderful microbiologist at Yale who has been on TWIM from time to time. She's taking a two-year hiatus Indeed. to do this job. Outstanding. And this is cool. She uh, was on a phone conference the other day where... She said that uh, Obama is very interested in microbiology and infection, and she thinks it's a really good time to try and promote the importance oh, wow. of the field. Terrific. Outstanding. That's good news. 
So she actually coined the phrase metagenomics. Wow. She's a really good scientist and very eloquent, and she has to uh, be approved by the Senate, so she will have a confirmation hearing. Right. And uh, someone on the phone said, uh, good luck. And she said, I need it because uh, this this phone call was with rational people. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So the, you know the the Senate is not terribly rational, but this is a great choice. I'm sure, she'll be confirmed. Yeah, and this will promote microbiology, which includes viruses. You know, it does actually. So thanks. congratulations, <laughs> Joe. Uh, Twiv can be found at iTunes and at Twiv TV. And if you like us, go on over to Twin to Twiv on iTunes and leave a a comment or a rating. That really helps us to stay visible in the crowded Apple iTunes directory. We do have a Facebook page, facebook.com slash thisweekinvirology, all one word. Do send us your questions and comments to twiv at twiv.tv. In September, I'll be back in Denver for ASM's ICAC meeting, and I'll be doing a live-streamed twiv there. And you can find details about that at microbeworld.org slash ASM live. Dixon Despommier can be found at medicalecology.org, verticalfarm.com, and trichinella.org. Thanks for joining us, Dixon. It's, a, it's an extreme pleasure to be here. An extraordinary pleasure? Okay, it's an extraordinary pleasure. It's, it's an unexpected pleasure. <laughs> well, I'm glad that you were able to do this today, and yeah, I hope too. we can do more in the future. We will. As long as you're around. I'll be. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida, Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough, always a good time. Thanks for doing that EBV research. That was no, cool. like, you know, I just, I just... I couldn't stop. <laughs> That's good. In other words, it went viral. <laughs> yeah, I just got, I just got, I just did the questions, just kept coming. I couldn't stop. Great. I'm sure Marsha will appreciate that. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Excellent. Don't go away, yeah. Dixon. Wait. We I'm have not... to we have to pick a title. I ain't going. A title. I know you you have to, you're dying to get out of here. It says the title of this one is uh, make sure you have all your ducks in a row. Now, I, I, I think there are two that I really... Well, there are a bunch of them. Let me tell you what they are, Dixon. Please, please. Bronx Zoo CSI. That's good. Now, this is I a virophage. <laughs> now, this is a virophage. All right. Alien. Alien. Iatrogenesis. <laughs> things that go bump in the night. Uh-huh. Matryoshka doll. And Twip infects Twiv. <laughs> oh, I, sure. I think Twip infects Twiv. Love it. Yeah. Love it. You like that one? Yeah, sure. Yeah, because what did we have before we had one like this? Where yes. So we did one with Futures in Biotech, and it was Twiv Infects Fib.